Sefecha, traditionally we are told that this book was written by Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu the prophet, uh, who was the prophet for the people of Yehuda for the 40 years before the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash, and also during the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, Yirmiyahu to me is one of the most uh, tragic figures in Tanakh, Tragedy in the sense that Hashem tells them really from the very beginning that you're going to be a prophet and no one's going to listen to you. And it's not really going to change anything. And therefore I have to give you strength and things like that if you read the book of Yirmiyahu. Um, and Yirmiyahu spends his lifetime uh, willing and exhorting B'nai Yisrael to change their ways and to listen to him and to see uh, to use an anachronistic term because it's from Daniel and not from Daniel to see the writing on the wall, um, and they just don't. They they don't uh, so much so that even when his prophecies finally come true, they still don't listen to his next prophecies, uh, and it's just absolutely heartbreaking. He spends his time not only trying to convince many Israel of the truth of his words, uh, but also um, fighting against. So you could say it's Yirmiyahu. Um, himself talking about his own experience, and that's what Rashi says. Rashi says that this is Yirmiyahu complaining, mitonein, um, which is really the word for complaining, um, about, and, he's, and Yirmiyahu, according to Rashi, is saying, I was the most afflicted of all the prophets. Why? Because I had to witness the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash. They just spoke about it. I was there. I witnessed it. And you could tell, Yirmiyahu saw this. He saw the films. He saw the destruction. So that's Rashi. Ibn Ezra, on the other hand, says, even Ani HaGever, yes, Yirmiyahu wrote this. When he says, Ani HaGever, it's possible that he's saying about any individual in the Israel. Now, the thing to point, so it could be every man. So you can say the two of this is it's every man, or it's any man. I like this idea of every man. Uh, and I think that unfortunately, most of the people here at the table can probably relate to what you're meowsing in certain parts of their life. I really hope you're not able to, but I have a feeling that at least part of it, people can relate to some of these feelings that are being described. Um, now you can also say that what Yirmiyahu is doing, and uh, Malki brought this up as an option, that maybe Yirmiyahu is drawing on uh, his own experiences to relate to the experience of suffering in general. And what leads us to believe, so there's certain things that, that would put us in Yirmiyahu's point of view. There's an idea of um, being trapped, there are ideas of being imprisoned, there are ideas of being in a pit. And the Midrash actually picks up on this and says, Ani HaGever, and they pick three people who are in pits. They pick Yosef, Yirmiyahu, and Daniel. And they're like, it could be any one of these guys. Because uh, they were all thrown into pits. Um, Yosef and Yirmiyahu were more, sorry, Yosef and Daniel were more clearly saved than Yirmiyahu, though. So it's a little bit of a distressing Midrash also. Um, so we could say that this is every man in a certain way. Uh, that Yirmiyahu is standing in and relying his own experiences of suffering, but in a way that any person can relate to and feel that they've also been through this. Um, and certainly anyone who's witnessed the destruction or been subjugated to its destruction. Um, so what leads us to think that maybe it's not just Yirmiyahu, it could be anyone? Achella? Um, I'm not sure if this would lead us to, but maybe why it takes specifically the word gather and not yish, which is more typical. Yeah. Oh, you want to know? So, Gever, um, people, one of the interesting things is apparently in, um, in, in epics from this area of the world, uh, in that time period, uh, when the word Gever was used to mean what the modern Hebrew word, the hero of the story, the Gibor. It's that person who went through trials and afflictions, but eventually came out of it. So that Hebrew root, which is related to a lot of the Semitic languages in the area, um, apparently meant you're like the hero of the story, and that's um, you're the protagonist or antagonist or whatever. Is that together the protagonist? Um, so it's the idea of being able to keep gaber to overcome 
these things also. Uh, so that's one of the possibilities of why we're using that there. Um, any, so that's part of it is to use the term, is to use the term meaning I'm not, there's no name of the person who's name himself. It doesn't go, any year me yahoo, by which he does in the book of year me out, but not here. So there's no name of a person. What else are we missing that would make us go, oh, that's definitely your Yahoo, or oh, this is definitely about the destruction of the baby Dash. Do you notice what's, it's harder to notice what's not there, especially since we didn't read Prep and Olive and that. Yes. like mention Yerushalayim explicitly. There's zero mention of Yerushalayim, even of a city, let alone Jerusalem, right? What else? There's God comes around only much later in first name, yes? Yeah. Also the entire Beit HaMikdash and Korban. There's no Beit HaMikdash, there's no technical destruction of a building. Um, there's not even armies, there are enemies. But the enemy isn't necessarily an army, if you've noticed. So there's nothing that ties this to a particular historical event except for the context within Megillah Eicha. So why do we have a parak that doesn't tie directly to this historical event? Maybe to be more universal. So why do we need a parak to be universal? Why do we need within Eicha to talk about this universal experience? Maybe because it's hard to almost like miss something that you never knew. So we knew that it would have to be something that we could all kind of connect to in our own lives. We all had like a form of destruction, but it might not be, we might not understand the exact form. Well, that's beautiful. I always thought of it from the other way. I agree with you, meaning the idea of not tying it to a specific event makes it universal and it makes it eternal. I was looking at it from the point of view of Yermi who's writing something um, that people can connect to as individuals, even if in, even in his own time period, so you don't have to see I me mean, tr treated as an individual or as a nation. And you're, put, you're taking it from the, remind me your name? Talia. Talia. So Talia is taking it from this point of view of, of when I read this now, like, I mean, the foresight that Yermiyahu had to know that we would need this in 2,500 years and that we would still be able to connect with this. And I think that's why when I said, like, read the news, if you, I mean, you can draw on your own lives if you have to. I hope you don't have anything to draw on your own lives in Tishbev. But if you read the newspaper, meaning, yes, you might not, you might not connect with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, but what the Beit HaMikdash stands for, that idea of um, a nation united um, following Hashem and pursuing justice and righteousness in this world and teaching that to everyone around us so that the entire world can recognize Hashem and can um, join in this pursuit of justice and righteousness and peace um, is definitely something we're lacking as individuals, as a nation, and as a world. So, um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people have trouble connecting to that, but if you read this parak, then you can connect it to uh, a personal tragedy you can connect it to a communal tragedy or a national tragedy or something that happened to another nation. You know, if you if someone were to take this parak and for sure the beginning of the parak and relate it to those boys stuck, stuck in a cave in Thailand, in Thailand, you know, the beginning of the parak would work very well for that. And then the miraculous salvation. Like, there are a lot of things that this can connect to. It is incredibly universal, the beginning. Um, and yet it's also very individual. Uh, so, let's, so let's focus in on our gather for a little bit and let's discuss what we've described as a description of suffering and, um, and affliction. And that's really what we're starting out with. Um, so, Adi, so we described Adi, I never right? I am the man who has seen affliction and pain um, through, the wrath, uh, ra through the rod of his wrath, Sheva and Ratev. Whose rod are we talking about? Hashem. Hashem. Hashem's rod. Now, it's called a shevet, um, right? The rod of his affliction. It's, it's called Hashem, but as I think Merrill pointed out, we don't actually see Hashem being called Hashem um, and being directed, to, related to directly um, for, you know, almost a third of the parak. Uh, we won't mention Hashem by name. It's him. 
But the him is very clearly him Hashem. And that's one of the strange things that this parak does, is how does the beginning of the parak view Hashem? Not, not so good. Not so good. Say the word. Don't, don't be afraid to say the word. What is Hashem in relation to this person? The enemy. The enemy. The destroyer. The afflictor. Right? And if Megillah Eicha didn't say it, we could never say it. And this is one of those things that I want to point out. It's one of the things that I like so much about Eicha. I know this sounds crazy, but is Megillah Eicha is perfectly comfortable, well, not comfortable, but it sees no theological problem with describing Hashem in such antagonistic terms and by viewing your experience in such a dark way. Now, it doesn't stay in that place, but it's okay hanging out there for a little bit. Malki. Yeah, and you're probably going to discuss this later, so I apologize. In no. Hands, but one no. of the things that I struggled with in our group was this particular, I would say phenomenon, but where it says that, that line where it says, I'm praying to Hashem, and he's not going to answer me. And then later on in the parak, it says, pray to Hashem and he'll answer you. So I'm thinking we're very much of a contradiction. How is that possible that in the same parak, we're discussing Hashem's not listening, it's all closed off, and you don't have, and now he's saying you can do it. So that really, I'm struggling with that, that a lot. So okay. I'm figuring you're going to discuss it, but I'm just We, thinking, we yeah. will discuss it. I don't know if I'm going to have an answer that you like, but we will discuss it, and maybe you can all think of the answers also and see. Uh, and that's really one of the things that I want to talk about is, I can't imagine the Tanakh without Icha. Because I can't, I think that this Megillah enriches Judaism so much because it allows us to, um, for really lack of me being able to think, talk smack about Hashem. Like talk, speak in a way that encompasses our experience of, um, of Hashem when when we can't make that connection. Now, if you notice, there's a little, some people really take this to um, this beginning as like also a philosophical expression. I don't think it's philosophical. I think our, our getter right now is um, stuck in his own emotions. And therefore also he can't even call Hashem by his name because either Hashem is so far removed or because he's too self-involved to see anything outside of himself or both. And maybe there's more to that also. So we're going to see our Gavar. Our Gavar where is our Gavar right now based on the word, like what you saw? Where? Uh, paint me a picture. Uh, the picture I envisioned was he's sitting in his cell one day, he was being captured, surrounded by bricks and stone and, and, and lots of gates. And, lots and of, physically beaten. And physically yeah. being beaten. And physically beaten. So you're now actually, um, part of it, he was actually in a bore, which is technically a pit. Um, and it seems, and he was locked up also in a field. Like it's, it's a little chatzar actually. Like so, it's unclear what the, but the fiscal we're getting this feeling of walls closing in, of shackles, of darkness. Right. So let's see. So there's both God is maybe imprisoning him or him being imprisoned, but there's other aspects. That's why people say it's Yirmiyahu. We're going to focus on reading um, the every man reading again. Maybe using Yirmiyahu at Yirmiyahu's drawn as of experience, which is what we do. Um, but your Yahu is every man. So, or he um, drove me, he guided me, but he, through darkness and not light. Right? He walked me, he made me pass through darkness and not light. I forgot to mention um, the, the rod of Hashem's wrath. So, um, Hashem has used this, Hashem, in the prophet Yishayahu talks about the idea of. Ashur Assyria being shaved at Ephratel, the, um, the rod of his wrath also. Wait, oh, Ashur, shaved at Api, sorry, of my wrath, a different word for wrath. Um, <coughs> the rod of my wrath, but remember that Hashem also, Shiftecha Mishantecha Hema Yenachamuni, God's wrath and his, God's rod and his Mishanet, his staff, can also um, guide us and, and comfort us. So here we're seeing something that in Tehillim is described as something that guides me and comforts me, and here it's being used to punish me. So Hashem is is also still Nahad. He's still guiding them like a shepherd guides the flock with its with his rod, with his staff, and yet he's not guiding him through pastures, right? Green pastures. 
he's guiding him through Choshech. And so Hashem, as opposed to being light, is now enshrouding this person in darkness. Ach bi yashuv, yapof yado kol ayam. He keeps returning to me and turning his hand over on me all day, meaning hitting me over and over and over again. Right? And this is often a feeling that the Jewish people have had in the past, which is this feeling of, okay, Hashem, enough already, leave me alone. Like, stop paying attention to me. And we, again, from a philosophical perspective, you can go and you can say, you know, Rabbi Levi in the Kuzari talks about the idea that Am Yisrael is like the heart amongst the body, and so the heart is the seat of all afflictions. Like, if the heart is healthy, the rest of the body is healthy. If the heart isn't healthy, then nothing is healthy. And the idea of we do get more attention from Hashem because we have a closer relationship, and that's for better and for worse. So here we see the worst. But I'm going to really try to stick away from the philosophical point of view. Um, and really deal with the emotional point of view of this person is feeling singled out by Hashem. In a way of like a kid who feels like a bully has singled them out, except in a much, or an enemy has singled them out for their destruction. Bila b'sari v'ori shibar at So he's, um, he's withered, um, he's, um, destroyed my flesh, he's broken my bones, uh, uh, a lot. so this idea of, you know, rotting flesh, which is very disturbing. Bana um, alai vayakaf roshut he builds around me and he has encircled me with, um, with bitterness and with, um, affliction. Uh, so uh, there are two ideas here. There's the idea of my, the actual body being broken, and there's the idea of being encircled and imprisoned. And those are the two ideas that keep coming up here. So the two, the big, the big uh, themes that are coming up here are themes of darkness, themes of being trapped, and, uh, and enclosed and themes of a broken body and a wild animal pursuing and being prey, basically. Um, he has sat me in darkness again, like those who are dead forever. Like the, so, and this is, what, this is when we start getting this feeling that this person is feeling not only am I trapped right now and am I in darkness right now, but there's no feeling that this will pass. Uh, there's one of the ways that I like to look at Eicha is um, through a psychological um, theory that has, I think in some ways, unfortunately fallen out of use. It's not in vogue anymore to discuss as much. Uh, it, um, it's a theory of grief, of the different stages of grief that was first started by a woman named Elizabeth Kolberos. I pronounce that wrong. Yeah, um, who uh, worked with very specifically with hospice patients, specifically in like the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Um, I think, yeah. Um, maybe it was cancer. Is it cancer? Was it cancer? It was like the before. Yeah, okay, fine. So it's cancer, sorry. Um, and, uh, and she discussed these ideas of five stages of grief that now people take it to mean, it's also people who are mourning someone else who they're going to lose or have lost. Um, but she originally discussed it in terms of people who are actually coming to grips with their own um, eventual or incumbent demise. Uh, and she discussed the stages of, um, and I'll, I'll explain the stages very briefly, um, but denial, anger, bargaining, Depression and acceptance. Those were five stages. Now, I'll discuss stages, but before I discuss stages, I want to say that uh, it's a, most of the stuff that's been written has been written by your students. And so her, people used to think, oh, that means you, have to, you go through these stages in order. Apparently, that's not the idea. The idea is that these are five feelings that, if you study on a whole, the people who are trying to face their own death. Um, often go through these different stages. Um, 
at different times for different time for different amounts of time, not in this order necessarily at all. It doesn't have to be in this order. Um, the idea of this theory is that it is good to go through some sort of acceptance, some sort of being at peace with this, um, which is something that actually, that's one of the things that's very much so fallen out of vogue is why does someone have to accept that this is happening to them? Um, but this was what she found people went through, in addition to her finding people went through this idea of coming to terms with the loss that they face. Now it really works in any type of tragedy. And what I want to point out is obviously um, what she was doing, she didn't, just, she didn't define this theory as this is what a therapist should do in order to work through these feelings with someone who's experiencing tragedy and loss. But rather, she noticed that these are universal, different people from very different walks of life are going through these feelings. And what I found as I was studying Eich, actually the first time I taught Eich here in Mishma, six years ago or something, was eventually, as I was thinking about it, I realized that um, pretty much all these stages are reflected in different places in Megil and Eich. They're all also in Parat Gimel. And so, uh, so we'll discuss now, again, these stages can come to play in different ways. But for instance, denial. Denial doesn't mean I don't believe this is happening. Sometimes denial is denial that I will ever be in a place that is other than this place. That I will ever, meaning that anything is ever going to change. Denial is often sort of numbness. But sometimes it's numbness. Sometimes it's denial to the situation. But sometimes it's, um, Denial to life going on, and there being another reality. And I think that that's part of this idea of kimite olam, this idea of like, I'm in darkness, I'm, I'm done, it's death, it's eternal death, it's nothing's going to change, this is the end. Um, so I think that that could be considered part of this denial stage. I'll point out when we see these other stages, and I'll discuss in the end why I think this is so important that all these emotions are here. Um, okay, so Gadar ba'adi v'lo itzei yichbi nechashti. So he's fenced me in, and ba'adi is because of me. I mean, the fence, it's not that I happen to get trapped in the fence, but rather this is a purposeful, I'm um, being fenced in, and v'lo itzei, I can't get out. Hechbi nechashti, the nechushtayim here are the um, the shackles, right? The copper, bronze shackles, manacles that are on him. Meaning, not only is he fenced in, but he's also like like Monkey was saying, there are bars, there are you know cinder blocks, and there's manacles, right? There's handcuffs. Pasukhet gam ki es ak v'shavei satam tfilati, and this is that first kind of. And also, if I call out and I plead, I turn to Hashem, he has closed off my prayer. And we're going to see how the prayer is closed off, but the idea of my voice is gone, I can't, nothing gets out. So, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss, the, but I don't want to get to the philosophical point. Right now we're dealing again, and that's also why I turned to Elizabeth uh, Kober Ross's um, ideas, is because this is a very internal, this is what the person is feeling. And we're saying it's okay to feel this way. It's okay to feel that it's okay to feel that Hashem is your enemy. Meaning philosophically it might not work, but emotionally, that is a feeling that people have sometimes in their lives, unfortunately. And certainly after experiencing a destruction like this on a personal level, on a national level. And I think that one of the things that's happening here, and one of the things that's so important in therapy also, is to just tell a person that is valid. It's just validating feelings. It's valid to feel that way. And it's valid to feel that Hashem has closed you up in prayer. Now, as some people point out, you'll see there's a difference here in when the prayer does go through, in terms of the person and where they are. But the person is feeling like, my prayer is closed off. And Hashem is the one who closed off. Yes. There's like a point where he says that a bad needs to like which makes it sound like he's worried that like his like thoughts or his complaining is causing him to We'll get there. We'll see it in five. Yes. Okay, remind me when we get there. Um Gadara Trachai Bigazit Nutibotai Iva. 
he has, and again, that use of the word gather, uh, a fence, but here it's, you know, he's fencing my path with, um, with hewn stones. I mean, again, that idea of I'm being blocked off. I can't progress, I can't go forward. I'm stuck in this place. And he has, um, he has uh, distorted my path. Uh, and so you almost get the feeling, so it's sometimes you get the feeling that this person's in a pit, and other times you get the feeling that the person's in a ladder. And so they are trying to make progress, they are trying to get out, and every time they keep hitting a brick wall. So sometimes you feel the person's stuck, and sometimes but then they talk about pair, pair, path, and they're like, okay, I might try to progress on my path. Through darkness, I'm walking in a dark maze, and I get to fly, I think I'm getting somewhere, and then you're hit with a wall. And the frustration that goes into that feeling of when you start to feel like maybe you can get out, right? You start to pray, God even if I were to pray, and even if I were to call out, but my prayer is closed off. Dov Orev Huli, Aryeb Ariba Mistari. He is an uh, a bear waiting to ambush and a lion hiding, waiting in like waiting to hide around the corner. Right? So it's that labyrinth with in the middle. What's the what's the beast that's in the middle? Uh, what's it called? Greek mythology of someone? You're also you're like oh, you know. into the next. What? Go ahead. Minnesota. The Minotaur, thank you, the Minotaur, right? So there's this like scary animal in the middle of the, right? There's, there's, a, there's a lion waiting in wait for him. And who's the lion? It's Hashem. So, and there's this very animalistic, there's a lot of animal, animalistic industry, uh, it, it, what, sorry, uh, imagery, thank you, um, being put out, right? The idea of my, of my flesh um, and my bones. Uh, being 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 uh, crushed that we saw in Pasuk Dalid, this idea of a, a, a bear or a lion waiting to pounce. Drachai, so where we fashtani, samani shomim. He has um, put my um, put my path with um, with thorns, and he has left me. Uh, desolate. Uh, so um, yeah, the idea of being torn apart, um, the idea of like that kind of raw skin, um, really just so much pain is going into this. Um, uh, that that word shomim, but that's a word that again connects ourselves to um, to Parak Aleph with Yerushalayim being shomim, being desolate. So, um, but there's still no rawness also, that like, raw skin. Darach kashto v'yitzivini k'matara lachitz. He um, he drew his bow and he placed me like a uh, like a target for his arrow. Uh, and now we get to the idea: Hashem is now not an animal that's mangling him um, or that's entrapping entrapping him and encircling him like prey, but rather this is more deliberate. There are weapons being used. Um, and those weapons are singling him out, right? He is the target, and that's again, like God is focusing all his anger, his wrath on this one person, and you just feel like, why does this keep happening to me over and over and over again? And that's what this, that's what our gever is feeling. He vi bechil yotai b'neish pato. He he brought in my in my insides and my kidneys. Um, his uh, his quiver. Thank you. That's the word. That's the word. Thank you. Um, right. His arrows dropping from my quiver on my back. So he's emptied his entire quiver of arrows into me. Right. Which shows a very deliberate. It's not just. He's not just trying to um, hobble me or or stop me. He's, it's it's this deliberate over. Where you don't have to empty an entire quiver into one person. One or two arrows is enough. I was a, um, a mockery to my people, to all my people, and they're you know, singing and ridiculing me all day. Um, and so now you're seeing people around him. So not only is no one helping him, they're like mocking him. Now that definitely fits with your yeah, right? People seeing his misfortune and not really coming to save him very rarely, um, but rather letting him suffer. So that very much so fits with Yermiyahu, and it's almost strange that you see other people around him. He was so alone until now, 
And now, all of a sudden, he's not alone. Um, there's other people there, um, but they're just laughing at his pain. Now, this also fits in again with Yerushalayim and Parag Aleph, where everyone left her, and now they're even mocking her. They used to love her so much. But here we just, um, the only time that we see other people is just people just not, you know, someone bruised and broken on the floor, and no one's helping them. He's, He's beyond the marine, her vani lava, he fed me um, bitterness and poison. Uh, they agree, sorry, I'm not doing like word for word exact. Um, that's what I'm happy to like, if you really don't know what something means, I'm happy but, um, to explain it. They agree, the chatzat shinai, he um, he broke my teeth with these like little stones and he, um, and he made me give up and like he kind of like pushed my hand, made me eat dirt, basically, is the image that I get from these words. Right? Like this isn't just about destroying, this is about humiliation, and this is about degradation, just bringing the person to the most absolute love. And therefore, so first we get this feeling again of Hashem as the enemy um, of not only trying using this person as a prey, but using this person as target practice and using uh, and obviously this takes the person. What happens when you're feeling this way, when you're feeling that Hashem is only focusing on you to destroy you? You get to this point of it has not, that he's not me shalom nafshi, nafshi I, I, my nefesh, which I often think in the Tanakh is this idea of a mind-body connection. It's your personhood, it's yourself. Um, so, um, the tranquility of my soul, the peace of my soul, was just completely abandoned. And I forgot goodness. So this person's forgotten tranquility, peace, and goodness. Omar, and then I say, I have lost my netzach. So the idea of netzach um, is often the idea of strength. That's what it's really connected to in general. So I've lost all my strength and my hope, tochalti, my hope from Hashem, the meaning, my strength and my hope used to be in Hashem. But after this experience, it's just gone, it's just completely lost. So this person mentions, um, and this is really the lowest that we get to in this beginning part of this pack. After feeling like they've, um, like they're trapped and that they're suffering so much, um, and they can't even, they know that Hashem's closing and they can't even mention Hashem's name, right? It's all, it's all me and it's all very much enclosed in the self. Um, finally, the first time we get to Hashem is the idea of maybe my hope and my strength used to be in Hashem, and now it's not. So the first time we get to Hashem is that feeling of Hashem is so far from me. And as much as this is the love, that I've lost my peace, and I've lost goodness, and I've lost strength, and I've lost hope, at the same time, this love, this rock bottom, ends up leading, actually, to a turn. Um, and I don't, so I would say, by the way, if we're going with Elizabeth Kovarov, this would be depression, right? This idea that everything is lost, just a total love. Um, so that's, that's part of what's going on here. Um, at the same time, when he gets the spot of losing everything, all of a sudden this person, if you notice all of this stuff, I should say, um, our Gavar is speaking in, um, in the present, right? This is what happened, and this is where I am right now. And what led to this place of being in such a low right now. Um, and what he's about to do is he's about to, one more thing, um, psychologically, with someone who's suffering um, in an extreme way, uh, that's all they can think about, right? They're stuck in that experience of suffering. If you've ever met someone who has chronic pain, it's very hard to think about anything else when you're in chronic pain. It's absolutely terrible. It's a horrible way to live. Um, but like so much of their energy is just on this pain that they're experiencing. So someone who's in crisis, everything is about that crisis. And it makes sense. It's not, you, can't, you should never blame that person psychologically for being in crisis. They're supposed to be in crisis. That's all they're, so they're stuck in themselves. They cannot see around them. They cannot see anyone else, they, and they can't, and our person also couldn't see Hashem. But one of the things that he feels like he's lost when he's being in circles is eventually he feels like he's lost 
he doesn't say he's lost God, he never goes that far, but he says he's lost his strength and his hope, which came from Hashem. I should point out also that if you notice, um, this person never loses faith. Meaning the belief that Hashem is there is always there. Hashem is the enemy, but Hashem is there. And also two things about this, which is obviously in ancient society, um, there weren't really very many atheists, or at least that we know of. There were always gods or gods. But the truth is, is that it wouldn't have been so difficult for the person to go, oh, I no longer believe in my god. Right, I now believe in someone else's God. That could have happened. So this person doesn't. He doesn't turn away from his personal relationship with God. He feels that he's being targeted by God. And I often feel, um, sometimes you'll see people have gone through very difficult experiences in life, and you see that, let's say, they'll, turn, they'll, they'll stop you know, to observing certain things or whatever, but you can see if you talk to them that they haven't stopped believing in Hashem. They're just angry at Hashem. And therefore, they're like, in Hebrew, called Barogas. Like, they won't talk to us now. They're, you know, we're in fight. Um, and obviously, this is a little more extreme than that. But that idea, those people often, they, they, they have more of a way back than someone who stops believing. It's a lot easier to come back from anger than it is to come back from apathy. And this is our person here. This is what they're doing. Because... Once they understand that their hope and their strength came from Hashem, then they kind of start remembering that time. Right? So the first thing that they remember is Zachar Ani Pasukit 19. Zachar Ani Umrudi La Rosh. So he remembered or I remembered my um, my distress and my downtroddenness and the poison and the bitterness. Right? So first, it's remembering all the horrible things that happened to me, right? Just thinking that this is part of a long line of suffering that I've been through in my life. Which again is understandable. There's no judgment about the fact that this person is in a depressed and dark spot. They're allowed to be there. But then, Zahor Tiskor, this is a difficult pasuk, it has a lot of different explanations, but Zahor Tiskor Vatashoach Alai Nafshi. Um, I remember it, and then the question is, what are they remembering? And what does v'tashoach alay nafshi? Um, v'tashoach can mean um, my nafesh is brought low, um, which is one possibility here. Um, the other, again, it's a little, it's a little different. My soul becomes humble when I remember. And what is he remembering, maybe? So even Ezra says what our person is remembering is they're remembering um, the evil. And not just necessarily the evil that has happened to them, but maybe also some of the bad stuff that they did also, maybe. Um, it's unclear. This is also, people say, so far, we can't, we don't have time to get into this pasuk. Um, but this pasuk is clearly part of the turning point. And I think part of our turning point um, is, um, is maybe the, um, that remember that being able to leave my, um, my present situation, which again, someone who's in the middle of suffering and crisis can only deal with what's present. But this person is able to leave their presence. And so when they start out remembering that, oh, this is a long, this is one thing in a long line of suffering that I've had. Yeah. Um, the other thing that that person remembers is they remember the, um, is, it also makes them humble because what else are they remembering? Zot ashiva libi al This I return to my heart, meaning I pay attention to. I start thinking about it, maybe keep going over and mulling it over in my mind. Or I tell myself to remember this. I force myself to remember this. Al kin ochil, and therefore I will hope. So in Pasuk, um, Yudchat, the person said, I lost my hope in Hashem, and now the person's saying, wait, no, now I'm going to remember this, I'm going to force myself to remember this, and I'm going to help. And what are they remembering? Chasdei Hashem ki lo tamnu, ki lo chalu rachamav, which is a very famous pasuk, which made into a song, very rightly so. The kindness of Hashem is, does not end. They ha it has not ended. Not that it doesn't end, it hasn't ended. And his mercy is not um, is not finite. It doesn't it doesn't finish. 
And the idea is not that, oh, God is abundantly merciful, but almost like God's relationship with me, that his, um, that his chasadim towards me also hasn't finished. We're not done yet. We're still, we're still part, we're in the middle of the story. We're not at the end of the story. And I think that's part of it. And what helps him understand, meaning what helps this person, all of a sudden this person feels like Hashem was the enemy just a few seconds before. What is it that makes them change their mind and all of a sudden start seeing Hashem as Hashem who has kindness, who has chasad? Remembering their culpability and all of that. So part of it could be remembering their culpability. Maybe I brought this on myself. That's and that's by the way, that's um that's part of what people that's, that's a lot of times what people say. The person hasn't yet mentioned their own chataim. That will come later. The chataim, the fact that I'm culpable and I have sinned, actually comes not for a little while. So I, so even though this is a lot of parsha, I mean, go in your direction, um, I have trouble reading it that way, that they're remembering their own culpability. So what else might it be? Well, Zolta Shiv in the Pesach before sounds like he's going to do Teshuva. So La Shiva Libi, so it's the same root as Teshuva, so I've got to understand this next kind of with the Pola, you're... Um, so, meaning Ashiv Al, but Ashiv Ali B, Ali B. The question is, what's the zot? Right, this is what I return to my heart. It's not saying Ami Ashuv Ali I'm returning to my heart. I'm doing shuba. I think we have a tendency because this is the theological path that we want this person to be taking is to suddenly understand that this is happening to me for a reason. I don't always think that's so realistic. And, by, and I think it's actually dangerous. Um, I think there's a lot of tendency, uh, for instance, there was a, to, I think there's a lot of tendency to blame uh, current events or tragedies that are happening on the person. Like you brought on yourself or on the nation, they brought it on themselves. And it's a da very dangerous thing to do. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, there's, because when you don't have Nebuah, when you don't have prophecy, you can definitely get it wrong. And Rav Lutzen talked about this, like, I don't understand why people are playing things. There was, a, there was an earthquake a few, a few weeks ago, and some rabbis came in and said, it's because of this, and I want to say what sin, they said it was because of, and I was, how do you know you know prophecy? You know prophecy nowadays. You can't know. Now, for an individual to look at themselves and to examine their own ways, is that's good and that's fine. And if you notice the Gebra is telling himself, he's not telling other people, oh, you did this wrong. That your man spends his life telling people you need to do Shuma for this, and it did not work. So, but to tell yourself something, to remind yourself something, is something else. I don't think this person is at the stage yet. They're starting um, introspection, but they're not actually at, um, they're at the part where they're no longer just feeling, right? If the first section we said, is a description of suffering. We have a transition in the design, the head of the remembering, remembering, remembering. And out of ten words, three of them are the root zahar, remember. And then we go to this zot ashiv al nashi, I'll return this to my soul. That idea also of trying to remember something and trying to integrate something into the way you're looking at the world. Uh, and so the next part is really a lot more philosophizing than it is just emoting and feeling. And that's, I call, the second, the second section, the main section, the middle section, this idea of philosophizing. And the first, and this first section, it, we haven't gotten into introspection yet as much as we've gotten into a retrospective of looking back. And he's looking back at history, he's not necessarily, some people say again, he's saying, oh, I, I said they brought this on myself. I actually think he's just saying it hasn't always been this bad. And that's when if you can remember the fact that there were good times in the past, you can remember the fact that there might, you can hope, once again, that there might be good times in the future. Meaning, if you were able to go from a good time to a bad time, maybe you're able to go from bad back to good. And I think that that's actually the first thing. Meaning, because someone who's stuck in their crisis can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel. And one of the things that actually, again, um, like I said I'm going to draw a lot on psychology, Psychology talks about this concept of resilience and people being able to get through these really hard times. And one of the key factors for resilience is actually your childhood and how secure and safe you felt in the formative years of your life and how much goodness there was there. And I was thinking about this just on my walk here, I was thinking about it. And I, 
And I, and I was like, wow, because if you look, even Yermiyahu describes like the times of our Nihut when we were young people and we were in the Midbar. And Hashem really coddled us and we're, you know, Moshe compares himself to a nursemaid taking care of us. And Hashem also like really just coddling us in that. So we're steeped in this idea of Hashem taking care of us as a nation. Which I think also ends if you if you lived through if you were people born into tragedy, I honestly have no idea. And so when I read this, I don't see him going, Oh, I sinned and therefore I think the Vitashuachalainashi, like I remember this and my and I'm humbled, is the idea of I remember what do I and I and I remember this that Hasei Hashem Kilo Tamnu, that the Hasid of Hashem is abundant, it has no end, it is eternal. Because and how do I know this? Because I felt it in the past. And I felt in the past, I can feel it again. And that's uh, one of the midrashim that's on your source sheet that we're not going to do, is this midrash that talks about um, Eifa as this, um, of the Jerusalem and as B'nai Israel, as a woman whose um, husband left her, but this knowing that he's going to come back. And knowing he's like, and how, and how we're supposed to remember that we can get back this relationship again. So I think that that's part of it. It's not, it's not necessarily remembering I did this to myself as much as starting to go, there were good times in the past, there can be good times again. Uh, we'll get to the we'll get to the same. We'll please get there. Chasei Hashem kilo tamnu kilo chale rachamak pasuk kaf gimel chadashim ba b'karim raba manatecha. Right, and the new things in the morning. There's your faith is abundant. Chalki Hashem amrana shi alkeno chilo. Hashem is my portion. My soul says, and therefore I will hope in Him. Meaning, understanding that you have a relationship with Hashem. That's the first thing, is understanding that even though I felt afar, even though in the beginning Hashem was a third person and he was so, Hashem was so far, I couldn't say Hashem's name. And I didn't see Hashem as you, I saw it as that, as that thing that was an enemy. But an enemy, again, there's a thin line between love and hate. There's a, that attention can become positive attention, negative attention can become positive attention. Um, and therefore I will hope in him. So again, he lost his hope, and now in Pasuk uh, Yed and now um, he's gotten his hope back. Alkin Ochilo, and my hope, just like my hope in the beginning was Tochalti May Hashem, right? My hope came from Hashem. Now I will hope for Hashem, I will hope in Hashem. Tov Hashem the Kova, the Nefesh Tidrishanu. Hashem is good for those who hope in him, for the person that seeks him out. Right, you have to seek out that relationship with God. In the beginning, that person was trying to get through the maze, but we didn't know where they were trying to go to. Right, they had a path, but we don't know where that path was going to. Now we see that what is that person supposed to be seeking? They're supposed to be seeking out Hashem. Tov v'yachil v'duma v'chuat Hashem. It is good, um, goodness and hope and and um, and and times waiting for um, the salvation of Hashem. Tov Lagever, so this is good. And what else? Tov Lagever, ki sa'ol b'ne'arav. This is a um, difficult phrase. It is good for the Gever, for the man, to bear the yoke in his young age. So the question is, what is the yoke here? What are we, what are we trying to bear in our young age? Um, one possibility is it's the yoke of suffering. Which I think is hard to say it's good to suffer in your youth. I don't think it fits in with the context here. It makes sense as a pasuk and standing on its own. It doesn't make sense the context here. But if you say that the yoke here is the yoke of Malchut Shamayim, then it's good to feel the weight of Hashem in your youth. Why? Because even if you start to feel like you've been lost by God and you've been abandoned by God, you can remember that weight at one point. Meaning, so it was good, let's say, for to have that strong relationship with Hashem, to feel that Hashem is your master, is above you, in your youth, so that you can continue with that feeling for the rest of your life. That makes much more sense to me in the context of what's going on here. And therefore, and since he has that, Yeshev Badad Yidom He Natalalav. He will sit alone and he will be quiet because he has placed it on him, meaning perhaps that idea of placing the yoke on someone, that meaning this oppression. The subjugation that this person is feeling is coming from Hashem, but it's not anymore um, weapons, but rather a yoke, the yoke of heaven, which is something that's used to build and something that's used to guide the person. So it's a very different way of feeling the burden from Hashem because it has um, positive reason behind it. Um, I do want to point out that Yirmiyahu also had to wear a yoke. Um, to describe the yoke of Bavel. 
so it often like it really goes um, it connects to that to me I mean, I mean I haven't walked around with the yoke for like three years or something sorry depressing. um this idea Yomiyahu is now actually saying that that aloneness that he felt beforehand is now um, I, will fin I will try to finish up and get the idea sorry we're not going to get to the whole part um, it's good to sit alone and be quiet meaning that idea of and that, that quietness and that loneliness that we felt in the beginning is actually important because that's important introspection and I think that this is the part of the main part of the change that's going on in this person is that they start to feel that maybe this destruction and maybe this burden that they're under actually has reason behind it and it's there to help them rebuild and it's actually part of their relationship with Hashem. Now, um, we don't have time to go through all the rest of the psukim, but I want to go into this idea of um, this basic idea of there's a lot of negative emotions here. We didn't discuss as much the anger. The anger will come will come soon. Let's actually let's finish this little section and then we'll and then I'll sum up in the next five minutes. We'll finish. You take that far and they'll put. Um, dust in his mouth, and people say maybe to make him quiet, to keep him quiet. But remember, we saw beforehand that Hashem like fed him dust. So it's saying like take it, take the punishment, um, because maybe there is tikva, maybe there is hope. That thing that he lost, maybe there is hope. You should give your, you should turn your cheek to the person who who um, who hits you, not turn the other cheek. Don't let them, but meaning allow them, right? And and or eat, take. That, um, that disgrace, he loathes not the Olam Adonai, because God will not abandon me forever. And if beforehand this person thought that, um, but he's not me shalom nafshi, that, um, that I have abandoned all, um, all peace, um, peace has abandoned me, I should say, peace has abandoned my soul, now the person says, Hashem will not abandon me forever. Now I will say, um, <coughs> The person does not find peace. We will not say, the person says, I've lost peace in my soul. The person does not find peace. But they do find Hashem. And they do find, they find, they forgot to God, they do find to, they found told to hope. It's good again to hope. And it's good to bear, a, to bear a burden. It's a different type of good. And this person has lost their, the person lost their tohala, they lost their hope. And then over and over again, words for hope keep appearing. The person finds hope. They haven't found goodness and they haven't found peace, but they have found hope. And I think this is a very realistic way to deal with suffering and to deal with pain and to deal with crisis. It's not to pretend that I was the same person that started out before I suffered. Once you've hit that blackness, you've hit the death, the, the death you, that you've, off, you've lost that tranquility. You might not find that tranquility again. But that doesn't mean you can't find a new way to live with that, to integrate your experiences into yourself and figure out a new relationship with Hashem and figure out a new relationship with the world around you. Because Hashem does not abandon you forever. You might feel abandoned, but Hashem has not abandoned you forever. Which I hope you got to do inside are saying basically that Hashem is not arbitrary about who he punishes. He punishes for a reason. There's a relationship, there's a reason for all these bad things happening, and it's and it comes from a place of filth, it comes from a place of goodness, and it comes from a place of justice. Which is how he gets to the idea of Hashem does not, you know, pervert justice or anything like that. That's the next chief sukim, but rather um, to the to the idea of, first of all, if I'm suffering, it's because Pasuk Lamed Zayin 37, Niza Who, what is it that could happen, that could be said and happen, that God did not command? I mean, Hashem commands all this stuff. Is it not that from the voice of above comes both the bad and the good? And this idea of remembering that there was good in his life, the idea of first of all remembering that the bad comes from Hashem as much as the good, and so the good can come again. And this is where he gets to the idea of what can you complain about? You can only complain about your own sins. This is, there's a few different ways to understand it. This is how we're going to understand it. He's saying, if I want to complain, 
I shouldn't complain about all the bad things that are happening to me. That you can't control. You can only control your own part in it. You can only control your own sins and the things that brought this upon yourself. Now, he doesn't say a control over everything. He says the bad stuff comes from Hashem. But what he does have control of, his own actions, he takes ownership of it and he takes agency of it. And therefore, that leads him to a communal idea because now he's part of the community and there's yeah, I should have gone faster. Um, <laughs> um, basically, um, our person start our our gever now speaks in the communal for the next few psukim, talking about introspection, searching your ways, um, and then to return to Hashem. And there's this idea of tshuva and the um, and the idea of nisalav avenu al kapayim al alba shamayim. We will turn our we will raise our hearts to God in our hands to the God in heavens, Nachum Pashan Marino, we have sinned and we have rebelled against you. And that seems to be like this high point because then we go with Atalo Salata. You did not forgive us. And the question is why is our speaker all of a sudden for these five, six Psukim speaking in plural, speaking as a community instead of speaking as an individual? Because as an individual, you can't turn to Hashem and say, I didn't deserve this. I didn't, we, we can, we can feel that way, and, but, but if you notice, he doesn't say that, he sees Hashem as an enemy, but he doesn't say, you did more, but as a community, over and over in Eicha, Yirmiyahu will turn to Hashem and say, Hashem went overboard, which if Yirmiyahu didn't say it, I can never say it, right, I as me, I can never say, wow, Hashem went too far, and yet Yirmiyahu does it over and over again, here he does it, we sinned, but you didn't forgive, it's your job, Hashem, to forgive, and you didn't do that. And the Midrash picks up on this also. What does that mean? That tell us all that you didn't forget. And it's turning it back to Hashem. And then all of a sudden from here, we go back to this negative idea. You have, you have covered yourself in a cloud and you wouldn't let the prayer fruit through. And normally the Hashem's cloud is the cloud of Shlina. But here the Shlina, instead of being part of a way to connect to B'nai Israel, is now something that hides him from B'nai Israel and hides Hashem from the prayers of B'nai Israel. And and you put us as something that's despised amongst the nation, and they open their hearts to all our enemies, and then and then we are talks about um, there's so much brokenness, and he says, My eyes, uh, this is Pesuk Nefet, right? My eyes are crying rivers of tears um, for the brokenness of my people. Right? My eyes are crying, but I can't stop crying. Um, that idea of crying, by the way, um, Yushalayim, Yermiyahu, whoever, the biggest crying is Al-Shem Batami. It's always going to be on the children, on the girls, on the women, on the babies. Um, that's always when, when you see crying, it's generally going to have to do with the children. Because the children are innocent in all of this. And when we remember this, we can't go back to the place of going, oh, Hashem, don't worry, everything's for the best, which we had in the middle. Because when you're going through crisis, or when you've just experienced crisis, you're not going to be able, it might be nice to sometimes philosophize and go, it's for the best and I deserve this, and, and, and which is the middle and really the center of the book of Eicha, but we don't stay there. Because our relationship with Hashem is not static, our relationship is dynamic. And we can sometimes have, we may start out in this place of blackness and darkness that our ever did. And then maybe we'll figure out a way to remember our past and to hold on to the good times and to say, okay, it can get better again, and Hashem is eternal, and Hashem is goodness, and Hashem is chesed. But then when you remember Hashem is chesed, so you remember, oh, I brought this upon myself, I did wrong, but then you remember, hey, wait a second, Hashem is supposed to forgive us. And he didn't, and he didn't let our prayers go through. And instead, he closed himself off like this. And then you're back in the blackness. Now, it's not the same kind of black, because Hashem is there also. Before Hashem wasn't there, now Hashem is there for you to be the But what do we ask for Hashem at the end? At the end of this parak, we're not at a place that we can ask Hashem to, even, even where we get to in parak hey, which is Shuvah Elad Hashem, sorry, which is Hashivini Hashem Alechem and Hashuvah, return us to Hashem and we will return. We're not at that place. Here, what do we ask for? We ask for the same thing that we ask for every single, at the end of every single parak except for parak hey, which is? Vengeance. And this is one of the most heartbreaking parts of Eicha today, which is that you would think that we would ask for redemption. But we don't necessarily feel it's the last one of Eicha. 
If you have rejected us, ma'os means despised, but it really means rejected if you look through Tanakh. If you have rejected us, then you've been too angry at us. Our last line of Eicha is actually a line that says, hey, Hashem, if you're going to reject us, then just leave us alone. Stop being that, stop hitting us over and over again if you've fully rejected us. And that's why we don't end on that line of Eicha. That's why we go back to the other line of Eicha, which is Hashivin Yuashem Eilacha, return us Hashem to you. Because we can't end on that line. But that is definitely the line that B'nai Israel feel throughout Eicha. It's Hashem, you've abandoned us, you've lost us, we've lost you. And that is why we don't ask for Geula at the end of this. We don't ask for rebuilding, because it's very hard for us to see that. We just ask that they get what we got. They have to pay for their sins. That the justice that we felt, they'll feel also. We just want them punished. Because we can't see goodness for us. We see a little glimmer of goodness in the middle of Paragimel. There's this little glimmer where we really have this philosophy and we understand that Hashem is behind everything and Hashem also is chesed and we can get back there, but we'll lose it again because it's too much darkness in Eicha. And we get swallowed again by that darkness. And one of the things, again, that I love about Eicha, as sad as it is, is the idea that that's okay sometimes to feel that way. That that doesn't mean we don't have faith in Hashem. And it doesn't mean we don't have a strong connection to Hashem. What we have to get to is that place that we see, that we still have a relationship to Hashem, even in this darkness. Now, Eicha sees, there's a big discussion, Eicha ends with that, Hashivim Hashem Eilecha Benashuva. Right? Return us Hashem to you, and we will return. And the Midrash puts up on this, and it says, uh, wait a second, another place, it says, Hashuva Eilecha, Hashuva Eilecha, return to me, and I will return to you. Hashem says, you take the first move. And we say, well, no, Hashem, you take the first move. Why is that? Why are we over arguing over who has to take the first move? So an Eicha, our feeling is, Hashem abandoned us. Hashem is the husband who left us. Whereas, if you go to, if you look in other books, it's clear, B'nai Israel left Hashem way before they left him. And so the Midrash also picks up on this idea. The Midrash, as I said, there's comfort in Lamentations, is what I call this class. For me, the comfort in Eicha itself is the comfort of being able to feel negative emotions while maintaining a relationship of faith with Hashem. Being able to feel, we talked about that denial, the feeling that maybe things will never get better, that anger to Hashem clearly, atalo salachta, right? We might have sinned, but you didn't forgive us. That's anger towards Hashem. It's blaming Him. That feeling of that feeling of depression, obviously, you definitely feel throughout that I'm brought low, I have no, I have no hope, I have no, I have no future, right? That's depression. Um, that acceptance, kind of that idea of there is acceptance in the middle. Maybe there is some sort of hope. Maybe I can put this back in. I can put the pieces of myself together. Um, the big thing that we don't have, though, in Eicha is we don't have bargaining. And the reason why there's no bargaining is because there's no one to bargain, bargain with. You see that very much so in this pattern. Every time we say we want to turn to Hashem, Hashem has closed himself off from our fears. We have tried to bargain. Hashem won't listen to us. Which is why we end with Hashem of this dual possibility. We end Eichel with one possibility of you return to us so that we can return to you. You have to take the first move because you've gone away from us. Or if you've rejected us, leave us alone. Stop our suffering. Now, just to close this all up, um, in the end I will say, I'll say that I think, again, like, Yarmiyahu didn't study Elizabeth Kogaras. Right? But these are feelings that we feel as human beings. And part of what, and this is what Rav Salvechik says, you can read the things yourself, the idea of Hashem never commands us not to feel our emotions. We're supposed to feel our emotions, and at a certain point we're supposed to use them to connect to Hashem. But allowing, I think that there's a certain element of comfort in saying, hey, you are human, you are built with emotions for a reason. You're not supposed to negate them by saying, oh, Hashem makes everything better, which is for some reason something that teachers often like to do. They like to like, try to convince their students that, like, no, don't be upset, don't be depressed, it's not good to be depressed, right? It's not good to, to allow yourself to feel negative emotions, which is completely against how Hashem built us. And also we see how the Navi experiences this. Why is Yirmiyahu in Ketuvim? Why is it Yirmiyahu in Nevi'im? Sorry, why is it Eicha in Nevi'im? 
because it is about the human side, Yirmiyahu is now speaking as part of B'nai Yisrael, as the Gever, as a representative of every man of B'nai Yisrael who's seeing this destruction. He's not speaking from Hashem's point of view. He's speaking from our point of view. People who have suffered and believe that their suffering comes from Hashem. And he's explaining how that suffering at first separates him from Hashem and makes him feel farther from Hashem. And that's okay to feel. And just that validity of those emotions that we feel when we're in a bad place is, I think, so important for us to understand that it's not someone who's telling you, oh, if you believe in Hashem, it means you only have to believe that it's all for the best. No, you're not always in that place. Hopefully you will get to that place. Hopefully you will get to that place of Tov Hashem Kovav Hashem Hashem is good for those who have opened him, for the person who seeks him out. But you won't always be there, and it's okay to feel that. And that's the first level of comfort. And that's what Yerim doesn't end us with any, straight, with any nice words of, and Hashem promises that everything will be okay. There's none of that in Eicha at all. But what do we have instead of that? We have that idea of it's okay to feel how you're feeling. And then you can turn all, the, but you should eventually turn that to Hashem, and hopefully Hashem will take us back and reciprocate. The next level of comfort that we didn't get to is where Chazal ends up taking this. Chazal will have a little bit more distance from the destruction, take it a little bit farther and show ways to lead to tshuva. Uh, that's a whole other class that maybe next year I'll be able to teach you. Uh, I hope you have a meaningful Tisha B'Av and hopefully you will sign up festivities because there will have been the redemption. And if not, that it is an experience that will lead to redemption. Amen.